you start wondering about your true self. <clears throat> you can't hold on to yourself. The very moment you give yourself up, you realise the self which is one with the universe. Precisely that self which I haven't thought up is who I really am. The two passages, all things are the form of truth, and all existence is Buddha nature, refer to that which lies beyond the personal. The entire universe radiates the light of the self. So I feel the entire universe. I'm not that fool playing with his pocket change. This body is the whole universe. If you don't have that kind of faith in yourself, you'll have a weak point you won't be able to hide. As soon as you get jealous or moody, you'll show it. Faith means having faith that you are the entire universe, regardless of whether your intellect happens to find that convincing or not. Only this faith can support the religious effort that never weakens. The Buddha way means having faith in your own Buddha nature. Each one of us, whether we know it or not, has Buddha nature. This, that means you are included in all things, manifesting the true form of reality. The form of reality lies open before you. Doubting this is wasted effort. To study the Buddha way means to study the self which isn't twisted, and can't be misled. Just forget everything you've picked up since you were born. What's called dropping off body and mind doesn't mean anything more than simply to stop insisting on I, me and mine. In Gaku, Kakudo Yo Jinshu it is written, having awakened mind means seeing in permanence. And the Vairokana Sutra says, awakening means directly seeing how your own mind really is. That means, above all, that seeing impermanence is truly seeing yourself. The expression non-self doesn't mean losing your mind. It means being one with the universe. The other side of non-self is all things are the form of reality. Non-self, non-mind, doesn't mean drifting away aimlessly in unconsciousness. Non-self means not going against what is necessary. It means obeying the cosmic order by functioning along with the universe. Is life inside of time? No, it's the other way around. Time is inside of life, and there's no life outside of your practice. You are yourself, and at the same time, you are the entire universe. You are the entire universe, and at the same time, you are yourself. That's exactly what the passages in Lotus Sutra express. There is only one Dharma, Oh, sorry, there is only the Dharma of one vehicle, not two, not three. When a drop of water enters the sea, and when a speck of dust settles on the ground, then that drop is already the sea, and that speck of dust is already the earth. When the flood of religious ideas reaches its culmination, they arrive at the point which Buddhism calls the self that fills the entire universe. All things are contained in myself. That's why, in my actions, I also have to pay attention to what others expect. The Buddha way shouldn't be unaware of society. The twofold truth of reality and the world forces the Buddha Dharma and human points of view to look each other directly in the eyes. Deluded living beings are the Buddha's best clients. That's why the Buddha Dharma has to be very careful on this point. It is because we are grateful towards society that whenever we use something, we think of those who will need it after us. If you have mind, you always have something to complain about. If you have no mind, you have no mind of compassion either. Don't have either mind or non-mind, nor non-mind. That's difficult. That means thinking from the depths of non-thinking. What's called beyond thinking is something so vast that it can entirely contain mind as well as non-mind. Beyond thinking isn't something you can calculate in your mind. The expression before the empty kalpa refers to the time when things didn't have names yet. So how could anyone expect there to be a final word on it? We can't measure a true Buddha. Buddha doesn't have a fixed form. That's why we can't measure him. When you call out Amitabha, you sound like you're calling a pet. But it isn't like that at all. Amitabha means immeasurable life, immeasurable light. In other words, limitlessness. When you ask what Buddhism is, the answers are studying the Buddha way means studying the self and truly recognising your own mind. So when you ask why we begin religious practice, the answer has to be that we are finally setting off on a journey in search of ourself. But if you're not careful, 
It might be that you're spending your whole life running around like a ghost without knowing what you're searching for or why. Step forth in your practice, walking in your straw sandals and getting blisters in search of the one thing without personal nature, without profit. This practice isn't something outside. It's turning the light inwards towards the interior of the self. You hear about the Dharma gate of peace and happiness, but this peace and happiness isn't how the world understands it. Finishing once and for all with that worldly peace and happiness is true peace and happiness. The Buddha Dharma doesn't lie in the distance, but we can't expect to get it for free either. It means becoming clear about yourself. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> for this chapter, I want to talk about um, you know, what is the true self and how am I supposed to live this self that fills the entire universe, as Kodo says. So I guess when we first hear about this idea of the true self or the universal self, um, it's easy for us to get sort of, you know, butterflies in our stomach like we've just sort of fallen in love or something. Um, it's like, a, you know, it's a very attractive idea. And, um, yeah, when we just experience it as an idea, uh, you know, at the beginning we sort of, our mind grabs onto it um, and we become sort of attached to it, I guess. Um, but I think, you know, this, I, I mean, this, this self, which Kodo, and, I mean, which you hear about all the time in Buddhism, uh, I, I don't think it's an idea at all, really. Um, this is why Kodo says in this chapter, uh, you can't hold on to yourself. The very moment you give yourself up, you realise the self which is one with the universe. Or precisely that self which I haven't thought up is who I really am. So anything to do with, I guess, how you think um, or how you perceive, uh, you know, this, this isn't this self that's being spoken about. Um, so if you're having this sort of special feeling about it when you, when you hear about it, uh, you know, it's just a sort of illusion really. Um, and also, I guess, you know, even if you wanted to look at this universal self from a, a factual perspective, um, you know, you could perhaps might be uh, e easily able to understand that, you know, you are a part of everything, you're a part of the universe as a fact. Um, but I think, um, you know, that's still just sort of, uh, you're still trying to grasp this, like, this thing with your mind and uh, it's still a, an illusion, really. Um, but I think at the same time as well, people are very um, seduced by this idea of the universal self, um, that in the meantime, you know, that they forget about their sort of, you know, they're just the plain old boring self uh, in the process. Um, I was speaking in the last chapter about these sort of creepy, serene sort of Zen teachers in the West. Um, and there was also a quote in a previous chapter about, um, you know, it's no, you're no good being this sort of perfect person. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, the universal self, this sort of thing is very attractive, but um, yeah, it's not just that. And like, I think, you know, when you're just relying on the idea and you're forgetting that, oh, maybe I'm, you know, a bit of a, I don't know, slob in the kitchen or the toilet or something. Uh, you know, you're, you're just sort of deluding yourself about this as, as, as an idea, really. Um, so this is why Kodo says, um, you are yourself and at the same time you are the entire universe. You are the entire universe and at the same time you are yourself. Um, so, I mean, this uh, sort of concept or whatever in Buddhism is, uh, is known as the twofold truth. So it basically identifies um, the relative truth and the universal truth. Um, so on one hand, you know, we can't help thinking of, you know, I and me, um, and the sort of, you know, we can't help being this sort of plain, boring person that we're used to knowing. Um, but then at the same time, as Koda also says in this chapter, um, you know, each one of us, whether we know it or not, has Buddha nature. That means you are included in all things, manifesting the true form of reality. Um, so, I mean, these things, essentially, this relative and universal truth or self, uh, you know, these things are coexisting, but, um, you know, at the same time, it's not about, you know, one being better than the other. Um, and, 
yeah, I mean, going back to what I've said at the beginning, you know, you, we can't just understand this point, um, you know, intellectually and think it's enough. Um, we have to somehow, you know, realise this in our everyday lives. Um, but, you know, this sort of thing with the universal self, I mean, you know, how on earth are, are you supposed to do that? Like, it sounds, you know, it sounds, it sounds complicated. Um, but I think, you know, in this uh, chapter when, when Quodo's, um, when Quodo says, uh, this body is the whole universe, and he's sort of emphasising this point. Um, I think perhaps, um, you know, he's suggesting a solution with this. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, understanding how to use our bodies um, rather than just relying on how we think is, um, you know, perhaps the best approach to understand how to function along with the universe, uh, as, he, as he says. Um, you know, rather than to just try and go against it, which is what our ego, you know, tends to do. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, usually we assume that uh, our thoughts and the way that we think, um, you know, that that's the master, like our, our thinking is in control of our body. Uh, you know, say if you want to eat a chocolate bar, uh, you just have to think, uh, oh, I want to eat the chocolate bar and then your hand will grab it and you'll start eating it. Or if you want to go to the shop and buy more chocolate bars, you know, you'll just start walking. Um, but I think in the same way that our, you know, our stomach will digest all that chocolate, uh, you know, our brain is just producing thoughts. Um, so, yeah, you know, our brain, just like our stomach or like our body, is, you know, it's just a, a part of the universe. So, you know, uh, in, in that way, I guess we can realise that uh, we don't have to necessarily make our bodies just slaves of our ego and our, you know, desires and this kind of thing. So, and I also think that when, you know, when Kodo's talking about this idea that our body is the whole universe, um, you know, I don't think he's, I know this idea isn't that our body is some, you know, incredible thing, like, you know, it's out of a sci-fi film or something, like it's, you know, it is, he's just saying it like as it is kind of thing. Um, I think it just, you know, it just means that when you stop insisting on yourself, on I and the ego, um, yeah, it's at that point that you, you're able to realise that you're actually just, you know, you are connected with, with everything. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I'm talking about, you know, how, how are we supposed to do this? Um, I think, uh, you know, an example would be, you know, say when we ride a train, it's possible that we make that train journey the whole universe. Um, you know, there's various ways that you could ride a train. I mean, you know, you, you could on one hand be a complete slob, you sort of sprawl your arms out everywhere and maybe you're vomiting or you're just sort of burping and it's just terrifying other passengers. Uh, there's actually, um, there's a, Instagram page I follow that's quite amusing on this subject uh, and it basically is like a com it's like a collection of uh, uh, it's called Shibuya Meltdown and it's about um, yeah basically like salarymen who get too drunk and then it's like videos of them like passing out across I mean they say Shibuya but it's, it's everywhere but like this is an example of this sort of how you're trying not to make that the train your universe and you're just being a slob but yeah I mean you've got this like this this guy is sort of passed out on the train and he's just sort of blocking everyone's way just like this <laughs> or you get I don't know you get somebody passed out on the street I mean this is not in Shibuya or the guy's just sleeping like this I mean these guys I am sort of vomiting and not passed out don't want a McDonald's but yeah I mean you know uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a basic idea that you're just on a train and you just have to be, you know, aware of other people. Um, but, you know, this is about your body. It's like about how you're, you know, you're, you're thinking of others and you're trying to incorporate, every, you know, if everything is a part of you, you know, you have to take care of it. Um, you know, and I think, you know, once you're able to, you know, change the way you behave and move your body in this way, it's kind of like, you know, it's possible that you are actually able to see how you are, you know, connected to the whole universe. I mean, and this is why Kodo says in this chapter, all things are contained in myself. That's why in my actions, I also have to pay attention to what others expect. Um, so, you know, this is like, this is to do with this thing that has come up a few times in the, from the Lotus Sutra about, you know, the, 
the boy in his uh, in his own house all the time. You know, like if everything is your house, I mean, perhaps a train ride, you know, maybe isn't what you imagine when you first picked up a book about Zen and you're sort of dreaming about the universal self. Um, but if you're not able to just be on a train and you know just sort of not bother people or bother everyone. Uh, you know, what, what's the point really, you know, you should burn those um, Zen books straight away. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, and also in this chapter, Kodo kind of talks about, I mean, he says it in a weird way when he says uh, something about like, I mean, he basically says, you know, you, sh you should pay attention to, to society and you shouldn't think of yourself as like uh, someone better than society just because you're you know, a Zen practitioner or you're a religious person, but then he kind of says something like, uh, something about clients, uh, yeah, deluded beings are the Buddha's best clients, which sounds a bit weird, um, but I think, you know, this idea of, you know, when you're in society, I mean, society, you know, perhaps in, in Antaiji, there's, you know, many exa you know, ways to practice how you behave and how you, you know, do things with your body and lining up slippers and all the things that, you know, you know, from the very first day you're here. Um, and, you know, you also have people who are helping you all the time by saying, you know, you forgot to line up slippers or you forgot to do this or blah, blah, blah. But in society, you know, it's a lot harder to... Um, I mean, you have to, you know, you know, you you have to do it yourself. I mean, of course. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's really, you know, it's a good opportunity really to to see these see this point to understand this point um, of this universal self uh, as something that's perhaps quite plain and ordinary. Um, so yeah, he says, you know, the Buddha way shouldn't be unaware of society. Um, so yeah, I mean, I remember watching this documentary about these like Chan hermits and it's like you know it's a cool documentary and these guys are living in caves and you know some of them are just skin and bones <clears throat> but then there's this one guy who just says uh you know like people are just like uh you know people are pathetic they're greedy and they stack up all their money and blah, blah, blah. and he's talking in this way and he's like really sort of hateful towards society and i'm just kind of like uh, like you know what's the problem like um yeah i just i think it's easy to kind of create a distance between yourself and society but you know this kind of idea of universal self actually comes into play quite a lot quite a lot when you're you know out there in the world um so yeah i mean perhaps you know this sort of idea of the self filling the universe just when you get a catch a train or maybe you're in a I don't know, supermarket or something, it's a bit boring. Um, but, you know, I guess so what? Like, I think, you know, you're kind of relying too much on this image of what this thing should be. Um, and perhaps you want it to be a, a very sort of intellectually stimulating thing. But, you know, sometimes uh, reality isn't. It's just quite plain and flavourless, as, you know, Kodo talks about when he says, when he describes Zazen. Um, so yeah, you know, basically it's not something that you can use a sort of your own, uh, yardstick to, to measure basically. Um, as you know, Kodo says, we can't measure a true Buddha. Buddha doesn't have a fixed form. So yeah, whilst the idea of the universal self, uh, as an idea is something that's sort of very stimulating, I think maybe just that plain old boring self, which, you know, some people might want to forget about when they uh, start practicing Zen actually is um, the thing you should be paying attention to. Um, so yeah, that's all for this chapter. Uh, does anyone have any questions?
Oh.